Awesome. So this meeting will be recorded. Um, just getting started here, uh, we had a couple of like technical issues we're just running through, um, but I'm really, really uh, happy to see everyone here today. Um, I know that the COP26 Coalition have a short video that they want to share uh, straight off the bat, so we're going to hear that first while people are still joining, and um, yeah, take it away, COP26. Levelers to those who trespass at Kinderscamp, ordinary people are the ones who change. Thank you. Is there anything else from the COP26 coalition? Are we we're good to go? If that's the case, uh, then I will say um, hello. My name is Leah and I work for War on Want. Um, we work on climate justice, we work on trade justice. Uh, and so we're really happy to be able to be uh, hosting this event today on corporate courts or ISDS with our allies, Global Justice Now, PowerShift, Transnational Institute, the Seattle to Brussels Network, Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development and the Corporate Europe Observatory. It's uh, happening as part of the COP26 uh, People Summit. Um, for those of you who have been following what's going on in Glasgow over the last week, you know the things aren't going very well. It's been highly inaccessible from the very outset. There's problems that the UK government has been played a key part in creating in blocking access um, to the global majority to vaccines by blocking the TRIPS waiver. Um, there are far, far fewer passes being given to civil society to attend uh, COP26. There is the obscene cost of, of being in Glasgow, changing rules, um, nonsensical rules on visas and vaccines that have made this COP26 all but impossible for lots of climate justice activists, particularly those in the global south to attend. So that's part of the reason why we wanted to have today as a digital event. So we could bring in voices of people who can't be there in person. Um, and uh, one of the other things that uh, we see missing from the COP26 um, this year, aside from the voices and active participation of those in the global south is also any mention of how corporate courts or ISDS mechanisms written into trade deals like the Energy Charter Treaty, like the CPTPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and thousands of bilateral investment treaties threaten the climate policy. They threaten the kind of um, climate pledges that countries are making at COP inadequate as they, as they may be. Um, the UK government has been attempting to dominate the narrative on COP with a series of, of announcements and initiatives while totally ignoring the fact that our trade and investment rules completely uh, threaten, block and slow down the kind of changes that we need to see to our climate policy. Um, so today is not only about highlighting that clash, but actually looking at how that's affecting countries across the world and looking at how countries can finally move away from ISDS and leave it in the past in the hopes of ensuring that our trade rule, rules stop preventing the kind of world that we want to see, one of, of justice for, for every, people everywhere. We have a, a great lineup of speakers today. Um, we have uh, Jean Blaylock, who's the campaigns manager at Global Justice Now, who's going to give a general introduction to ISDS and, uh, and the challenge that we face we face with, with the climate. 
We're going to hear from Ari Kroniawati, who's a National Pro Pro Program Coordinator at Solidaritas Perempuan in Indonesia, who will speak about ISDS cases in the Extractive Centre and Community Resistance in Indonesia. Um, and also um, Indonesia's experience in reviewing and terminating its bilateral investment treaties. Um, we're going to hear from Rob Davies, who has more than a quarter of a century of engagement in, of issues in international trade and regional integration. Uh, he was the uh, South African Minister of Trade and Industry for a decade and worked for a very long time before that, also uh, in the um, government on, on, on trade. And before, before that was an academic and anti-apartheid activist. And we're finally going to hear from Kyla Tienhara, who is, um, apologies, Kyla, if I'm butchering your name or indeed anyone else's, uh, the Canada Research Chair in Economy and Environment and Assistant Professor at the School of Environmental Studies and Department of Global Development Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, um, who is uh, studying and researching the intersection between environmental governance and global and the global economic system, particularly um, looking at ISDS. Um, so to kick things off without too much further ado, unless we have other um, sort of admin uh, housekeeping things that I should know, please do flag. Um, we will hear from from Jean. So I'll pass over to Jean. OK. Hi to everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people uh, joining on a Sunday morning to talk about these issues. So I'm just going to give a really basic sort of intro um, around what uh, ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, is the formal name. Um, corporate courts is what we tend to have started calling them here in the UK because that's kind of what they are. Um, they enable corporations to sue governments outside of the national legal system for billions. It's a one-way privileged legal system. Uh, it's not something that you can use to hold corporations to account. It's only for corporations to sue governments. It only works that way around. And corporations have used it for a massive range of things and are increasingly using it over climate action. Uh, five fossil fuel companies are already suing <clears throat> for over 18 billion of uh, climate action. Um, so that's the kind of the, uh, a, a brief statement of what it is, but it maybe sounds a bit abstract and a bit dry. And, um, uh, and so I'm now kind of going to tell you it more of a, a bit of a story about some of the cases and about how I came to sort of really realize how much um, this is having an effect on, um, on climate action. So, Corporate courts are something that my organization, Global Justice Now, has been campaigning on for a while. And if I had been talking about this issue maybe five years ago, I would probably have talked to you about a range of cases across sort of um, something, something to do with, uh, with public health, uh, a cigarette company suing over the introduction of plain packaging on cigarettes, something to do with public services, um, a uh, UK water company suing when Argentina capped consumer water prices during the financial crisis. Um, I mean, there is all issues of justice, but I would have also included one thing that was about climate, um, a company called Lone Pine, um, which was suing the Canadian government uh, over a ban on fracking. And I'd have included it um, because it, it, it was a climate example, but it's also a great example of something that I think is quite characteristic of the way that these corporate courts get used, which is that when you have a eventually often after a lot of struggle, a people's victory, a community victory, corporate courts are used to slap that back down again. So in that case, um, the 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 Quebec government had opened up the St. Lawrence River Basin um, for exploration around fracking, but there had been growing public concern around this for many years, around 10 years. And that started with um, you know, petitions and local actions and concerns and those, those, those groups connected together. At one point, there was a march that was organized by communities along the whole length of the St. The, the St. Lawrence River. Um, and they stopped in um, all of the places that they went through and they held various events and they ended with a big massive protest and demonstration in Montreal. Um, and at a certain point uh, around then, I believe there was a survey done that showed about 80% 
of the population of Quebec had concerns about fracking and were worried about it going ahead and didn't think that it should be. Oh. And the, um, the, the federal government in Quebec, spot, as a result of all of this public pressure, said, OK, we will set up a commission to look into this um, and uh, and they set up that commission and you know sometimes these things are just a way of kicking things into the long grass but the commission came back and said yes these concerns are valid there are valid concerns we think maybe you need to look into it a bit more but in the meantime you should introduce a moratorium um, on, on fracking while it's considered further and so the Quebec government um, did took those recommendations and said, okay, we will follow these recommendations. We will introduce a moratorium on fracking. So you've had years of, um, of public protest and concern that has led to this point, a sort of a long uh, process, proper process has been followed of uh, research uh, and, and, uh, and recommendations going to the provincial government, the provincial government takes action. It's all been um, a democratically appropriate process as a result of democratic pressure and you have a change in the law and the result is that um, the, the, uh, the fossil fuel company, one of the companies that, um, that had a license, I know it only ever had an exploration license, um, but it decided to sue over this. So that was a case to do with climate. And then I realized there's another one. Um, it's a UK registered company this time called Rock Hopper, although it's a bit of a letterbox registration really. Uh, and they wanted to drill for oil off the coast of Italy. And it's a very similar story in a way. You have a lot of public concern uh, around it. Um, they want to drill off the coast. Uh, the, well, it's a tourist area. Um, and so there were concerns around that it, um, because it's not great for your tourism to have a big um, oil rig uh, off site of the coast. But it's also an environmentally sensitive area. And there are also the climate concerns around it. And again, you have protests, you have demonstrations, eventually the Italian government um, decides to reintroduce a ban on um, drilling for oil within 12 nautical miles of the coast. And this company, Rock Hopper, decides to sue. And one of the, again, um, a thing about, uh, you, you know, suing for far more than they've, than they actually have. Um, it's, uh, it, Rock Hopper has not, um, it, it, well, they reckon that they have in, in, had invested between 40 to 50 million uh, at that point in actually getting things set up um, so far for the drilling, although um, what they actually wrote down on their accounts was a slightly smaller amount. But anyway, that's, that, that's what they say. But that's not what they were suing for. Um, they decided that they were going to sue for um, what they reckoned was the total value of all of the oil that they estimate was in that field if all of that oil was there, if they could get it all out, if the oil price held up, they reckoned that they could get over 300 million in it. And so that's what they sued. They're suing for their expected profits if there had been no risks, if absolutely nothing had gone wrong. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's an exaggerated system in that sense also. And then as another well, two climate cases, but related, comes along to do with the Netherlands and the phase out of coal power. And here, if you if if you go back to 2015, um, in the year 2015, um, uh, that was the year of the Paris Climate Treaty, and the Netherlands was signing up uh, along with other countries and making commitments, um, climate commitments over that. But it's also the year that um, an energy company, RWE, opened a new coal-powered fire. I can never say that, coal power station. Um, and there's a bit of a contradiction between those two things, signing up to climate commitments and opening new coal power stations. Um, and, uh, and climate activists in the Netherlands, as in the UK, as everywhere, were, you know, a bit for, they had been, they had been campaigning for years, um, feel like sometimes you're not getting anywhere, steps of, 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 of opening new coal power stations is almost like a backward step. And there's actually a, um, a group, an alliance of civil society organizations who decided to sue the governments themselves in the national courts, in the democratic legal system. They decided to take the government to court and say um, that 
if you are serious, you know, these commitments that you have just signed up to, you need to do more if you are to live up to those commitments. Um, and in the way of such things, the case took a, a couple of years to go through the courts. And in the meantime, you continue with the activism that I'm sure many of us are very familiar with, protests, they had climate festivals, um, demonstrations, petitions. Um, and actually, in the end, when the, the court case that's being brought by, um, by the people uh, comes to judgment in the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court agrees. It says, yes, if the Netherlands is to live up to its commitments to future generations, then it needs to do more. And as a result of all of this pressure, the public pressure, the legal pressure, the Dutch government changes its mind. It's OK, we will phase out coal power. We will phase out these coal power stations. And as soon as it starts um, saying that it's going to do that, then RWE and another company, Uniper, that had also um, opened another coal power station, start very publicly threatening that they are going to sue in corporate courts. Um, and sometimes these cases can be incredibly secretive. Um, it can be very, very hard to find out even um, that, that anything is happening at all. So when um, companies are, instead of being secretive, they're being very public about it, I fear that they are aiming at a chilling effect. And this is something that has been seen um, with um, some of the earlier cases. So that cigarette um, case that I mentioned back at the beginning, um, that was Philip Morris suing Australia of uh, plain packaging of cigarettes. And Australia was not the only country that was um, thinking of introducing that at the time. Um, it was something that had come out of a, a UN process. And so several countries were looking at introducing the same measures. Australia happened to get there first and it got slapped with this case. And um, as soon as it does, all of these other countries just held off. They would not admit that they were doing it. Um, they would all just say, oh, you know, the white paper is taking a little bit longer to, to get together, or we, 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 have a, we have a crowded legislative agenda. We just need to take a little bit longer to find the time to deal with it. Uh, um, but all of these countries just sort of waited until they saw what happened with the case. And actually, Philip Morris lost that case on a technicality, not actually on the substance. As soon as it lost, then those countries, including the UK, went ahead and they introduced um, their, their similar legislation. But time was not, because these cases are not quick. It was, I think it was about seven years that it took to, to get through that case. Um, so that's seven years of time lost. And if you translate that to climate action, we have already lost so much time to inaction and, and, and just doing nothing. We cannot lose more time to people worrying about the effect of those cases. But that's, that's bad enough. Um, uh, that that feel that that chilling effect lasted during the length of the case. But I actually read um, some research earlier this year um, that had looked a bit wider, and it said that while the chilling effect of that case lasted in rich countries um, during the duration of the case, the chilling effect lasted much longer and is still going on in many countries in the global south, which is entirely understandable because those countries know themselves to be far more vulnerable to the threats from um, corporations, um, the vast amounts of money that it takes just to fight the, a case like this. It cost Australia millions just to fight it, let alone the risk um, of, of losing and being slapped with one of these massive fines. Um, and that's something that we cannot afford. So while RWE and Unipa are ostensibly bringing their case against the Netherlands, what I fear is that they are seeking to send a message much wider to many governments around the world saying, maybe you just don't want to do this. Maybe you want to be much more cautious. Maybe you want to just step back. Maybe you want to do less. And the world cannot afford that. The world cannot afford governments to be having yet another worry and concern that is slowing down the action that they ought to be taking on the climate. And having seen these three cases, and they all have this characteristic, I realize this pattern um, is, is, is something, this pattern where you have a democratic victory that's being pushed back by a corporate court case is something that's actually happening writ large, that globally across the world, 
because of the pressure from activists, from um, uh, everywhere taking action, governments are slowly being pushed into, into slowly beginning to take the steps that they ought to be taking. And those steps threaten the status quo. They threaten the power of many of the fossil fuel companies who are invested in that status quo. And those fossil fuel countries, country companies are turning to this system of corporate courts, which is designed to protect their status quo to protect their privilege and so we can expect to see more of these cases and indeed since since the RWE and UNIPA cases we have seen we've seen a central resources start suing Slovenia over fracking and just this summer um, a big case uh, a company TC Energy is suing the US government over the cancellation of the Keystone oil pipeline. It was one of the, um, the first things that Biden did on his first day in office was to um, cancel uh, the tar sands pipeline saying it was incompatible with sustainability demands and indeed it's being sued for doing so. So that's the system that we're talking about. That's the threat that we see to the climate. Those hopefully are some of the cases that can make it seem real and, and clear. And I know um, the others on the panel will then give more information, more background, and hopefully we can go deeper into that system. So thank you. Thanks very much, Jean. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I want to, one thing I forgot to say earlier is that we want to have a time for Q&A at the end. So if you do have questions about anything the speakers have said, please put them in the chat. And they're going to be um, sort of collated by my colleague and I'll have a chance to pose them to the panelists at the end. Um, it was really uh, what Jean said about the, the way this system has been used to exploit um, sort of a, a dynamic that exists within our global economy, an asymmetry between global north and south is, is really clearly seen in ISDS. You have countries like the UK, which have been the home state for investors suing global south countries, but the UK only having faced one case itself. And that, that's true of many countries in Europe and, and the US, where the vast majority of ISDS cases are taken against countries of the global south. So it was with that in mind and with the knowledge that um, this is not just about money, but it has, has real sort of tangible impacts on communities living at the literal coal face of the extractive industry. And um, that I wanted to invite our next speaker, Ari, to speak about uh, the experience of, um, of Indonesia in, um, in dealing with this uh, corporate court system. I also want to just um, mention that uh, for more information on the history of ISDS, uh, we have some already have had some um, kind of talks, uh, Global Justice Now and other organizations that have been organizing this have, have had a series of webinars on these issues. And I'm gonna put a link in the chat to uh, those, those uh, talks so you can check them out and learn more about the history of this destructive mechanism. Uh, but I want to now introduce Ari uh, to speak and to uh, we, we she has a presentation as well that I think Lucia is going to uh, share for us. Do we have Ari here? Uh, yes. Hi, Elia. Hey, Jen and everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. Do I need to present my presentation or you can uh, share screen for me? Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Ari. I'm from uh, Solidaritas Perempuan. It's a feminist organization in Indonesia. So we work together with a grassroots woman and we also monitor uh, free trade agreements and also in investment agreements uh, related to the government of Indonesia. And I am also uh, as a program organizing committee of uh, women interrogating trade and corporate hegemony of APWLB. And I am, I am also joined uh, in a collective uh, called uh, sbilaterals.org. Maybe you can uh, show the next uh, slide, please. So, uh, 
Jen already give us a context about the ISTS. And if you really interest to monitor or to uh, get an update uh, from uh, the ISDS case, uh, we have this uh, website and we also have a ISDS case map. Uh, it launched uh, in this year and uh, we can see uh, cases uh, based on the country uh, on the map. Uh, so uh, if you if you may see uh, one of articles that we post is about missing uh, issue from the climate talks is about the corporate powers to sue governments over extractive uh, policies. So uh, the growth of suits uh, brought by extractive industry, industries has been exponential. Since 1995, uh, when an extractive industry brought uh, their first case under an international agreement, they have brought claims demanding at least uh, 195 billion US dollar and won awards totaling at least uh, 73.2 billion US dollar. And uh, these figures are based on available data from Exit and UNCTAD, uh, really in a huge number. Other arbitration tribunals uh, do not publish information about cases or awards, but uh, we may see that extractive corporations not only use the ISDS system the most, they also receive the largest monetary awards. Uh, and this is also happened in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is data from our colleague in Indonesia uh, for global justice. In the last nine years since 2011, there has been an increasing of six cases of investor lawsuits faced by Indonesia. Uh, the first case was uh, in 1983 and the second case uh, in 2004. From this total of eight cases faced by Indonesia, as much as 50% were in the mining sector, including those uh, filed by Churchill Mining in the UK, Planet Mining, uh, Newmont Mining, and Indian Metal Vero Alloys or IMFA. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, there are some major cases, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, case Churchill Mining and Planet Mining. So in 2011, Churchill Mining and its partner in Indonesia, Petri Datama, submitted an appeal against the, against the verdict from Samarinda District Court is Kalimantan. So the submitting of the lawsuit is based on the revocation of our mining licenses. Uh, and the second one is about the uh, New Monusa Tenggara case in July 2014. Uh, Newman Mining Corporation brought a case against Indonesia using the Indonesia Netherlands uh, BIP at the exit. So this is a, a case that becoming a background uh, when the government of Indonesia eventually uh, refused uh, its BIPs uh, from uh, several with with several countries. And the third case about the Indian metal vero alloys, uh, it happened in 2015. But I will not go through uh, into it. Uh, next slide. So as uh, Lea uh, mentioned uh, in the earlier of our conversation, in 2013, uh, government Indonesia conducting a critical review to a 64 BIPs that have been signed as a basis for the termination of all Indonesian BIPs with all countries. So uh, the rationale for reviews conducted by government of Indonesia is basically similar to the reasons for reviews conducted by other countries. Uh, among others, our uh, review has been carried out to achieve a balance between investor protection and national sovereignty. Uh, the, sec the second one is most of the IT provisions provide a broad protection and rights for foreign investors and leave the host country with a slightly or no policy spaces to implement its own development goals. And the third one is one of the biggest of Indonesia concerns on the IT is provision of investor state dispute settlement, which has increased uh, Indonesia's exposure towards investor claim in international arbitration. And the last one, uh, they, uh, the government mentioned that the provisions uh, in the BIT potentially rule out uh, national legislation. 
but up to this moment, the government of Indonesia has not wished to publish uh, the latest text uh, from the BIP review concluded, co conducted, sorry, uh, as we, the civil society organization, civil, organis uh, civil society organizations, tried to access uh, the, 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 the last uh, reviewed document or the they call uh, the government called as a new model of the IPs, but we still uh, cannot access that. Uh, however, Indonesia has once more agreed on a bilateral investment treaty with Singapore. So the BIP is signed by Indonesia and Singapore in 2018. There was no Indonesian Singaporean uh, BIP text published since its signing. And moreover, information on the ratification process has never been open to the public. Uh, so from uh, SP side, uh, our position is uh, to review BITs are not enough. Uh, because of what? First of all, the high, the high cost of BITs is making the corrupting of the states. When foreign investors make use of their right under ISDS to sue their host government, the BIP meant to benefit the host country by attracting foreign investment. Instead, confronts the government with very high costs. The worst scenario is when a government loses on an ISDS case. The damage are payable out of public budgets, which in developing countries can have a safer impact the funds available for public policy. We see this have a gender dimension because when a public budget cut uh, to pay for this, uh, this ISDS uh, mechanism or for these tribunals, it means they, uh, they can cut a public budget that where, where women have a really burden on like a, like a health, water, electricity, and others. The amounts involved can be really substantial. So this is actually so contrary with the aims of uh, our government to increase uh, the foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investment. While the other facts uh, in March, uh, I would say in March 2014, Indonesia ended uh, 17 BITs including deals with Netherlands, Italy, France, Spain, and China. Uh, but in, 2000, in the same year, FDI to Indonesia hit a record high of 78.7 US dollar trillion, according to uh, the Indonesian Investment Coordinating Board. While in 2015, the uh, FDI from Dutch government to Indonesia increased by 19.2% in relation to 2014, and the, and the Netherlands remained the fourth leading sector. So, Basically, no empirical evidence that investment treaties and investment protection increase foreign direct uh, investment as shown in, uh, in many studies. Because, uh, yeah, the government uh, always arguing that uh, we need to give a full protection for the investment because we need to attract the investment and so on. Uh, and the second one, uh, BIT serve to challenge uh, national laws. It it is actually happened uh, when the government of Indonesia passed uh, the Mineral and Coal Act uh, number four year 2009. Actually, it was meant to make uh, the Indonesian economy less dependent on the export of unprocessed raw materials and to encourage uh, the development of national processing industries. The law obligated uh, mining companies to refine and process uh, minerals inside the country prior to export. This was to increase the state's income from extractive industries and to create jobs uh, for Indonesian workforce. However, by the end of the same month, after intensive lobbying by mining companies, the Indonesian government finally agreed to amend the regulation as the mining company required or wish. Uh, and the minimum, the minimum threshold of mineral concentration for export was decreased. Uh, and the obligation to build uh, mineral processing capacities was postponed. And uh, the third uh, reason is about the lack of transparency in ISDS cases. So uh, in, in their lawsuits, corporations uh, must often cite protections uh, in FTAs 
and the IPs against uh, indirect expropriation. So this is interpreted to mean uh, regulation and other government action that uh, reduce the value of investment. Hence, corporations uh, can sue government over the enforcement of uh, environmental, health, and other public interest laws or measures arising from democratic or judicial processes. Uh, to the next slide, please. Uh, so I totally can say that uh, corporate courts is basically reinforcing uh, neocolonialism uh, north uh, to the south uh, countries. And it is also terrors over climate actions required because of, uh, we see from the experience of uh, government of Indonesia when they actually facing uh, the, the, what you call it, like uh, when they uh, get sued by the, by the, by the foreign invest, investment or by the foreign corporation, uh, they will lose uh, their ability uh, or their sovereignty to make uh, required uh, steps or required actions to protect uh, their people's rights, to protect the, the environment, and also to take uh, steps to really doing a real solution and a real uh, climate actions uh, ahead. Uh, that I think uh, that's enough for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ari. That was that was fantastic. Some really great points raised there about how ISDS is. Uh, taking money out of the public budget and the impacts, the real life impacts that has, particularly for uh, for women. Um, APWLD uh, has some great resources exactly on that, which I'd recommend taking a look at if that is if you're interested. Um, also about the lack of transparency around ISDS and about ISDS being used to undermine and overturn the intended impact of, of national laws. Um, it's... Uh, We've had some great questions come in so far, so I'd encourage you to um, keep putting them um, in the chat. Um, and I'm going to move on to our next speaker now, who is Dr. Rob Davies, uh, who's speaking to us, uh, I think from South Africa, um, to reflect on uh, the experience of South Africa in, in terminating uh, bits. And, and precisely as, a, as um, will likely link into this uh, this issue that Ari also raised, that there's a falsehood about the uh, alleged connection between signing up to investment agreements and foreign direct investment um, that we continue to hear trotted out, even though there's so much evidence to the contrary. Sorry, that, that's enough for me. Uh, on to Rob. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> let me say that uh, I do agree with the uh, premise of this uh, particular panel that uh, this broken ISDS system uh, could have a detrimental effect on a just transition to a lower carbon economy, uh, even though I have to say that I don't think that I'm aware of any particular experiences in South Africa of uh, challenges to particularly to, to um, uh, climate uh, change mitigation. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to speak more, more generally about that. So um, South Africa, as you all know, was a pariah state under apartheid, was excluded from a huge range of uh, international uh, um, economic uh, arrangements that were in force in the world. And in the uh, immediate aftermath of our democratic transition, uh, we were bombarded with pressure uh, to sign a host of uh, bilateral investment treaties uh, in the name of uh, attracting foreign direct investment. So we signed many of these things. And at one stage, it almost became a routine matter of any engagement with a foreign government uh, that you signed a, a double taxation agreement and a bilateral uh, investment treaty. And um, <clears throat> after some time, uh, we uh, looked at these things and uh, had a review of them. And um, that review was the, the basis of the uh, decisions which uh, which we took during during my time as as the minister, and I think the first thing that uh, we I need to say is that the bilateral investment treaties that we signed were based on the then prevailing model, which was the so-called OECD model, 
which provided for a, an expansive definition uh, of the investments that were going to be protected, uh, an expansive definition of both uh, direct and indirect expropriation. Uh, so uh, indirect expropriation was change in public policy, uh, which would undermine uh, the expectation of profits. Uh, there would be uh, uh, expectations of fair market compensation. And then of course, the, the right of the investor to take the state uh, to the, um, uh, the, the, the international uh, tribunals. And um, we saw also over time that there was a, a, an, an expansion in this increasingly litigious uh, system. So that um, in 1996, the number of cases that went to the uh, International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes was 38. Uh, by 2018, it had risen to 706. The average cost of litigation was, uh, and it is, uh, had to be stated in foreign currency, 8 million US dollars. And the average award in case of an adverse ruling was about half a billion uh, US dollars. So this was a, an expensive system. One of the first conclusions that we drew was the one that you, you asked me to comment on. There was absolutely no correlation whatsoever in whether you have a bilateral investment treaty with a particular country and whether there's any flow of foreign direct investment, even taking into account the, the definition of foreign direct investment includes mergers and acquisitions. It's not just uh, you know, green fields opening up of uh, productive enterprises. But uh, for example, South Africa, we never had a bilateral investment treaty with the United States or Japan, had quite significant investments from those two countries. And uh, in the case of many of the countries that we signed, uh, bilateral investment treaties with, uh, we found uh, uh, no uh, significant increase uh, in any investment uh, from those countries. And then I think we were also seeing the, uh, the kinds of uh, public policy issues that were being challenged. Um, the Australian tobacco case was mentioned, but one that particularly struck us was that the same issue uh, was, uh, was, 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 was targeting uh, Uruguay. Uh, and that uh, that was a, a, a very uh, serious wake up uh, call to us. Uh, we, we had perhaps less dramatic experiences ourselves, but they were fairly significant. We had a, an Italian company uh, that uh, wanted to challenge uh, the change to the mining license re re regime, which was going to provide uh, for some kind of empowerment uh, of historically disadvantaged people and, and, and communities uh, as a condition for a mining license. Uh, this was going to be challenged. And in fact, uh, the, the litigation began uh, um, in, 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 in the, one of these tribunals. Uh, we had a, another company that uh, was a victim of crime, uh, which was going to sue the government. Uh, in other words, the government uh, was going to be an insurance uh, 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 company uh, providing protection against uh, any kind of uh, crime. Uh, and then we even had an individual who uh, bought shares in our reserve bank. We still have private shareholders in the reserve bank uh, and wanted to cash out and claimed uh, that he ought to have a share of the uh, reserves of the country which had been built up at that particular moment. Uh, and uh, he threatened to go to the, the system, uh, even though his own government, Germany, was not in favor of it. Uh, and I think this was the, 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 the situation that we faced. And we had a very, very immediate challenge. By 2012, um, many of these bilateral treaties that had been signed uh, in the period uh, immediately after our democratic transition, they came up for renewal. And uh, it was either that you, you gave notice to Mapson uh, or uh, you, uh, they were automatically renewed for another 10 or 15 years, depending on, on, on the treaty concern. And in the end of the day, we decided that uh, we had no option other than to take the decision to lapse in. And that, of course, uh, is something that created enormous pressure and an enormous backlash. Lots of, uh, of, of suggestions that uh, uh, foreign investors were going to walk away, uh, that we were going to face Armageddon if we did this. Uh, that uh, and we had this pressure from uh, the European Union, the European Commission at the time was, 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 was uh, really cheerleading a chorus of voices uh, to tell us that this was uh, a really bad thing to do. Uh, but in fact, uh, we, we, when we did this, 
uh, we find there was there was no real reaction uh, of uh, real foreign investors. Uh, in fact, uh, the very month that we lapsed the agreement with Germany, uh, Mercedes-Benz announced the largest uh, single investment uh, in the motor sector uh, in South Africa. And I think this points to to something that uh, is really significant, and that is that foreign investors probably look at the concrete opportunities there are on the ground rather than the, the levels of uh, protection that you offer them. And that those that use the system are often not the mainstream investors that you want to encourage in the first place, uh, but they are peripheral interest groups that are trying to seek some uh, particular vested interest over and above uh, public policy. The other thing that we did was we introduced our own protection of investment law. Uh, in which we, we specifically indicated that there was a right to public pro policy, a right to regulate, uh, in which we, we provided against uh, protection against uh, in expropriation according to the constitution of the country, where we said on things like national treatment that uh, uh, there would be uh, guarantees of treatment uh, no worse than uh, that which would be accorded to South African companies in like circumstances because that became an issue that some companies were beginning to say, well, if you have a black economic empowerment or the state gives a particular incentive to some public corporation or something, we must get the same uh, and use uh, national treatment as a, as a claim for that. Uh, so we, 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 we made, we clarified on that. We introduced the system of, um, of mediation uh, as a first step. We said, of course, one of the advantages of, of a law of general application applied to everybody, whether there was a bit there before or not, a bilateral investment treaty there or not. Uh, and uh, we then said you had to exhaust the domestic uh, jurisdiction, uh, the, the domestic ju uh, judicial processes. Uh, and that uh, we did, uh, in the end, uh, agree to, uh, to, 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 to uh, international um, uh, arbitration, but uh, only on a state-to-state -state basis. So that's what we did, and I'm, as I say, I think that that that, that we we uh, in a way, uh, I think we showed that that uh, you can walk away from the system without Armageddon, uh, without the the world coming down uh, upon you. Uh, although I need to say that um, I am told, and I haven't been in government for two years now, I'm told that there is still a, a, a huge pressure from different quarters saying the same old uh, refrain that we've always heard. Uh, if you sign a, a, a bilateral investment treaty with us of the sort that we have been walking away from, uh, there is this packet of money which is available for uh, investment. So I think that the, uh, the points that have been made here by, by all of uh, the other speakers, uh, that uh, this transition to a lower carbon economy is something that is going to require an enormous amount of work for us to achieve a just transition. Uh, in our own country in South Africa, where we have got a significant uh, coal uh, industry still, um, we, we, the, the Paris commitments, which have actually been upped in the, uh, in the, in the, in the Glasgow meeting, uh, but the Paris commitments, it was estimated, uh, would, re would, would result in a decommissioning of assets, and that's not even talking about jobs lost or communities affected, uh, uh, equivalent to about 60% uh, of the GDP of the country uh, in a single year. Uh, so this will be a very significant transition. And in order to ensure that it's a just transition, we need to ensure that public policy and public regulation can act in the general interests of communities and peoples, uh, as well as in the interests of uh, making our, um, um, uh, our common but differentiated contribution uh, to uh, you know, um, in, uh, uh, resisting uh, or averting uh, a catastrophic climate change, catastrophic climate change, which, by the way, uh, was not caused uh, by uh, peoples in the south, but was caused by uh, countries in the north. Uh, but uh, uh, making that contribution, we can't have this uh, impeded uh, by the claims and interests of really uh, quite speculative and uh, vested interests uh, who are acting uh, uh, to, to, to put their own uh, claims and gains uh, above those of public policy and the public good, uh, which I think is the essence uh, of the ISDS system. So I think that um, this ought to be a moment when we look at a, a range 
of uh, laws and regulations. I would say they need to be uh, trade laws. We need to be looking at intellectual property laws and all sorts of other things, uh, which I think uh, need, to, need, need to be rebalanced uh, as the world goes through something which I think ought to be uh, uh, in the order of uh, a global Green New Deal. So let me stop there and uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Rob. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, really very much uh, want to agree with you there on that last point that we often end up, up talking um, about ISDS as if that's the only problem, but actually it's only the start. It's uh, in some ways, uh, you know, when, when we hear kind of the, the facts of the matter from voices like yours, it's hard to be, hard to understand why more governments haven't already moved away from ISDS. Um, just looking at everything that's already happened. Um, so um, I'm going to, um, uh, some great questions again coming in. Um, please continue to, to put them in the chat. I'm also going to link to a book that Rob wrote, which is a, a fantastic read about um, the history of everything that's been going on with the WTO and much more in the chat. And I think he also has some other resources he may share. Um, and I, before I move finally to, to Kyla, who's going to speak um, to uh, something other speakers have also uh, mentioned before to the scale of um, kind of of the ISDS awards, particularly that fossil fuel companies have been seeking from uh, governments from ordinary people across the world. Um, so I'll move over to Kyla now, and I believe you have a presentation as well. I do, I will just share that now. And while I'm uh, sharing it, just wanna say thanks very much um, for the invitation and for organizing this, this fantastic event. Um, it's really great to be able to talk about the two things I, I care about most, uh, climate and uh, get, getting rid of corporate courts. So good morning, everyone. Um, uh, there's been some great talks already. I'm gonna try my best not to repeat anything that's already been said. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to focus really on climate, and I'm going to just go quickly through a few slides that are probably not going to be uh, new for this audience, but I just want to make sure we're all, all on the same page. So my starting point here is that we need to keep a lot of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground uh, because the carbon in those reserves, if burned, would lower carbon budget and push us well above two or even three degrees of warming. There's a recent study by Wellesby et al. in uh, Nature Journal, which crunched the numbers and determined that the amount that needs to be left in the ground for to keep below 1.5 is 89% for coal, 59% for fossil gas, and 58% for oil. That's globally. In some places, like in Canada, where I am at the moment, uh, the numbers are even higher. So the idea of unburnable carbon and unextractable reserves uh, logically leads us to the idea of stranded assets, um, which basically, in plain English, means fossil fuel companies have invested a lot of money in finding coal, oil, and gas reserves and have them on the books as delivering profits in the future. Similarly, there's a lot of infrastructure, pipelines, ports, and so forth that is associated with the extraction, transport, and combustion of fossil fuels. It's going to lose value or become worthless in a Paris aligned wor world, just repeating pretty much what Rob just said. Importantly, uh, asset stranding can result from a number of factors. Market forces are obviously very significant here. When you see a plunge in oil prices that occurred uh, during the pandemic, a number of carbon majors were forced to write off assets, uh, particular in places, again, like the Canadian tar sands, which are very expensive uh, to extract. But asset stranding is really an issue elsewhere as well. Um, for example, earlier this year, Global Energy Monitor, Monitor released a report suggesting there was a risk of 87 billion euros of stranded assets in the gas sector in Europe. So when assets are in the tar sands or elsewhere stranded due to economic forces, that's not really what uh, we're concerned about today. What we are interested in is the idea of assets being stranded by government action. Uh, so in particular, the types of things that might lead to asset stranding are restrictions on extraction, such as refusing to issue permits to exploit fossil fuel deposits, canceling existing permits, banning outright some certain forms of extraction, such as fracturing, uh, phase out or bans on the combustion of fossil fuels, such as phase out of coal power, reduction or the elimination of fossil fuel subsidies, and limits on the development of infrastructure, such as pipelines and ports and so forth. Now, I personally believe that these are the type of policy measures we need to see a lot more of if we're going to keep below 1.5 degrees. Market measures like carbon taxes are simply not doing the job on their own. But these kind of measures are also very direct. And by that, 
I mean that there's a very clear line that can be drawn between the government action and the negative impact on the owner of the asset. And this means there's more likely to be calls from those asset owners for compensation from the government. And this is where international investment law comes in. Uh, so there, we've already heard there are um, a lot of international investment treaties, over 2,600 actually. Uh, most of these are bilateral investment treaties or BITs. And then there are also the plurilateral trade agreements that have an investment chapter, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Canada-Europe deal known as CETA. Also very important here is the Energy Charter Treaty or ECT, which mostly covers Europe, but also Japan and a few other countries. It's notable for being focused exclusively on the energy sector, and it may also be the first large investment treaty to be canceled over climate concerns. So these treaties uh, generally protect foreign investors and investments from direct and indirect expropriation, which Rob already mentioned, and also requires that they provide things like fair and equitable treatment, most favored nation treatment, and national treatment. I'm not gonna get too much into these details. If we wanna talk more about that in the Q&A, we can. The most important thing for you to understand is that the language on these standards is really vague and open to interpretation. And one of the biggest problems is the requirement for fair and equitable treatment, which basically has been interpreted by arbitrators as meaning that states need to, to provide stability to investors and insulate them from changes in policy. Easier, obviously, to, uh, to understand this by looking at specific examples. We've already heard quite a few this morning. I'll just add a few more. So Westmoreland Coal versus Canada. Uh, basically, uh, a couple of years ago, the, the province of Alberta committed to phasing out coal-fired power by 2030. Uh, and without having any infrastructure to export coal, this plan effectively was a de, de facto phase out of local th thermal coal mining. To ensure support for the plan, major utility companies in the province were provided with transition payments so that they could switch to fossil gas or renewable energy. And the US company Westmoreland did not receive a government payment because coal mining companies don't really have a role to play uh, in this transition. But the company thinks that this is discriminatory and is seeking $470 million US in compensation. The other coal phase out story you've already heard. Um, the only thing I would add on this one is that um, an RWE spokesperson said that the Dutch coal phase out was not legal because it does not include adequate compensation for this interference in the company's property. So that comment about adequate compensation is something I really want you to think about. Who do you think should determine what level of compensation, if any, companies like RWE deserve, given that they have made their investments in full awareness that they contribute to climate change and that the world has to move rapidly away from fossil fuels if we are to avoid catastrophic levels of warming. And then also the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline is a big case uh, in the United States. Uh, if you don't know, I'm sure you probably know about that project, but it was basically a project to bring tar sands petroleum uh, from Alberta through parts of the US, stream the controversial big campaign against it. It was actually first canceled by Obama and that sparked an NAFTA dispute and a claim for 15 billion in compensation. Then Trump came along, reversed the decision and the company dropped the case. And then in a development that really surprised nobody except the premier of Alberta, Biden canceled it again. And then TC Energy, um, which is the Canadian company behind the project, brought the case uh, to NAFTA again. Uh, it's worth noting that, um, that these types of cases won't be uh, possible in, under NAFTA for much longer because the new uh, treaty uh, that Trump uh, negotiated rules them out between Canada and the US at least. Uh, so as with the case in South Africa, it is possible to get rid of these, uh, these rules. So the, those are existing cases, uh, and there are a few more, but there are not that many for us to speak about at this point. Um, why is that? Because we haven't really seen that much government action on climate change. So much of my research at the moment is about thinking about how many cases we might see if governments finally get serious and where they might emerge. So last year, I worked on a report with Lorenzo Catula at the uh, IIED, an organization based in the UK, that looked at all the coal plants that need to be closed early if we are going to keep within 1.5 degrees. And we found that 75% of the ones that involve foreign investors were protected by agreements with ISDS. And that is likely an underestimate. It's also worth noting that most of those plants are in countries uh, in the global south, such as Indonesia, for example, which have much less capacity to deal with these disputes than countries like Canada and the Netherlands. Right now, I'm working with colleagues at the Global Development Policy Center at Boston University 
to examine investment treaty coverage of fossil fuel assets in the upstream oil and gas sector. That research will hopefully be out early in the new year. But just to give you one example, uh, these are the foreign investors that are involved in uh, Vaca Muerta Basin in, in Argentina, which holds 8.7 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. As you can see, uh, almost all the investors uh, that are involved there are protected by treaties. So this is just one example of a place where we need to, to stop extraction. And there's going to be real problems if we do. If you want another example, Shell has a minority stake in the Cambo project and is protected by the ECT. So if you want to stop Cambo, you should also want to stop the ECT. The other point I want to make is that fossil fuel companies really know how to use this system. Uh, because they've been using it for many years to challenge the imposition of windfall taxes, environmental regulations, all sorts of things. I found 173 cases involving the fossil fuel sector when I looked, but uh, I've recently seen a, a report that will be out soon that found quite a few more than that. And on this slide, you can see some of the examples of carbon majors that have been awarded in the range of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in compensation. Why are these awards in these cases so insanely high? It's because the system, uh, in this system, investors can claim lost future profits, uh, not just sunk costs. So if a country decides to ban offshore oil and gas fracking, companies with planned projects can argue that they should be compensated not just for the money they spent on developing the project to date, but also the money that they expect they would have made if the project had proceeded. I know Jean said that already, but I think it's worth reiterating, uh, because how is that not a huge fossil fuel subsidy? especially considering that these companies have known for decades that their business model was destroying the planet. So just to summarize, addressing climate change requires an energy transition that involves rapidly phasing out fossil fuels and this will create stranded assets. When actions lead to asset stranding, the asset owners often seek compensation. If those assets are protected by investment treaties, they can take their claim for compensation to an international tribunal which may then base their award on wildly speculative notions of lots of future profits. And how, in this, how will this in turn uh, impact the energy transition? There's two major concerns I have. The first one you've already heard about, uh, regulatory chill, Jean has covered this, uh, basically the idea that governments uh, will delay action or, or won't act at all because they're concerned about being sued. The second one uh, is a little bit more subtle. Um, but I think it's, it's increasingly going to be important. Uh, basically, the, this is the idea that governments are going to end up compensating investors more than they otherwise would have, uh, either because they're forced to do so by an arbitral tribunal or because they are negotiating with investors uh, under the shadow of ISCS. So an example of this is that there has been some suggestion uh, that the, the threat of arbitration influenced the very generous compensation package that Germany provided to coal investors for its phase out plan and basically, if, if this is what's happening, if compensation is higher, then we have a diversion of public money to fossil fuel investors that should have been spent on ensuring a clean and just energy transition for everyone. And also just to reiterate, obviously, this is a much bigger problem uh, in the global south. Um, countries like Germany can possibly af afford this, other countries cannot. Uh, so with that, I think I'm well out of time. So many thanks for listening. And if you are interested in more detail about uh, compensation and ISDS, uh, you can check out that report from the IED. I'll put a link in the chat. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Kyla. I have to admit that it's been really hard to do a good job of timekeeping when the content of the talks has been uh, so engaging. Um, but it's always shocking to hear what uh, what your research un uncovers, uh, the, the sheer numbers involved. And that we have fossil fuel companies who've been fueling the climate climate crisis, essentially saying, even though we knew about the climate crisis, and even though I knew that there was going to be government action, um, I want not only what I have already invested, but what I would have made in the future if the in investment environment remained preferable to me. And I'm going to sue under an agreement that your country may have already left. And I want the public to pay for it. And it could be a massive proportion of your GDP equivalent to what, what a country spends on health. It, it beggars belief. Um, so uh, that was our, our four speakers um, who I want to uh, make sure I get in a thanks early to for, for dialing in from all over, uh, from dialing in all over the world in different time zones. And um, we're going to move now to uh, Q&A, which I will thank Lucia for having um, collected. 
Um, I think I'm going to read out a couple of them and then just do a round of uh, responses so that um, uh, the panelists can, can respond to whichever one or ones were particularly relevant to them. Um, so one maybe is a good one for Jean to speak to is I'd love to know in what ways we on the ground in a place like London can fight these courts. Is it effective to do a very public shaming campaign of the law firms who are fighting on behalf of the fossil fuel companies? And to also to hear from all panelists radical ideas on how to topple the whole system of these illegitimate courts, or at least getting a foot in the door to create some cracks in their dominance over other systems. Um, there is another two questions which I think are kind of linked. Um, which are about uh, the energy charter treaty that Kyla had mentioned that um, it is it might be one of uh, an agreement that ends over uh, gets cancelled over climate so to expand a little bit on that comment um, and a question directed to Rob um, on the comment that you can walk away from the system without Armageddon and the question is, does it make any difference who the you in the sentence you can walk away is, um, I guess, speaking to, uh, yeah, what the what the specific experience of, of um, different countries have been in rejecting ISDS. Um, so, yeah, perhaps maybe just a round of reactions. Um, from there, uh, I'll start with, with Jean uh, in the same order that you originally spoke. Um, thanks. So, uh, yeah, I mean, to, in terms of what, what, what you can do, uh, I certainly um, think there are, well, I think this, this is a system that thrives on secrecy. Um, when you tell people about the existence of ISDS corporate courts, quite often the first reaction is disbelief is saying no 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 you must have misunderstood that can't be true how could such a system exist and then when you convince people complete outrage and the more people know about it the more indefensible it is so the more that we can publicize it the more that we can just uh, let people know about the cases, about uh, the, 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 the effect that it's having, um, the more that uh, really drags the system into the light. And it's a, it's a sort of vampire strategy, drag it into the light and, and ideally it will, it will explode into a shadow of dust. I mean, if it was that simple, it would be great. Um, uh, but certainly law firms is something both Leah and I have been looking at because the UK is a, uh, a hub for the, the specialist law firms that, um, that really drive this, um, th this system because they're not, they're not just neutral players in this. Um, the law firms that specialize in this system, they go around touting for business and, um, uh, and pointing out opportunities without even much looking. I just sort of looked on the website of one of the law firms in the city of London, um, the newsletters that they put out to their clients and just the most recent newsletter, it said, uh, uh, Mexican government, it has made some reforms to the electricity sector. If you think you're affected by these fraud forms, you could be affected in these ways. These are the treaties that you could use to sue. And so they're basically telling their clients, go out, sue another government. Uh, and they are drumming up business for this system in that way. Um, the, the industry kind of does a listing of the top 30 law firms every year, a sort of a, a ranking, the companies themselves are proud of being in it. Uh, and all but two of them have offices in London. So trying to do more around the law firms also to expose their role in that system is, is certainly something um, that, that, that will be great. Um, yeah, things and, and things that we, we did, a, we did a sort of a, uh, a circus stunt outside of some of their offices earlier this year. We've also done projections, um, projecting messages about being climate criminals onto some buildings owned by Unipa. Um, yeah, we're certainly trying to think of more and more things we can do about that. I put a link into the chat um, with some of the petitions. If you sign the petitions, then we will get in touch with you about some more of these ideas and things that people might be able to do. And on the ECT, just to say, I think that's that's the result of pressure. 
it's because it's become so much so controversial. I mean, it's not an automatic thing. I don't think we can just rely that the ECT is going to be cancelled. But there is so much pressure on it. It is creaking at the seams. And the more pressure we can put on it, it's really vulnerable. So if we can just keep up the pressure, then I really think that that is something that we may be able to win on. I'll, I'll stop there and let others say, say more. Thanks, Jean. Um... Ari, do you have any any responses to that about about how we kind of encourage citizens in our own countries to to speak out on rejecting ISDS? Um, or have any? I mean, please feel free to speak to any of the other um, reactions to the other speakers' interventions or or any of the other questions. Uh, yeah, I would like to highlight what uh, Kayla already mentioned about uh, not only. On the BIT's uh, DISDS mechanism threaten uh, threaten uh, people's rights, but it is also uh, we can found uh, in the trade agreements that uh, most of uh, most of developing countries really aggressive or massively to sign on. Uh, for instance. Uh, Recently, we just signed uh, the RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So it really involves uh, in the region, uh, the Asia and the Pacific as well. Uh, and the ratification process is on the way. Uh, so it, even though we successfully uh, cancel uh, the ISDS mechanism uh, in, the sign, in the sign process, but they have a uh, what do you call it like a like a like a like a article that mentioned that in 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 the two years after the agreements uh, implemented uh, so the the countries the member uh, the member state can really negotiate about uh, uh, it, whether the ISDS can be implemented uh, or not. So it is kind of a really huge uh, threat uh, in the in the developing uh, in the developing developing countries like in Indonesia, and also for the LDCs that already ratified like Vietnam, Thailand, and others. So uh, what I'm talking about, like I would like to highlight what uh, Leah already mentioned. This is really asymmetric between uh, global north and south. So uh, we really, you know, like when our president really in the front of a uh, member of G20 countries and uh, there was a, like, a, you know, like a celebration how our country can be really in, in line with the developed countries. So there is really thing uh, when uh, the government really uh, involving in the negotiation process uh, between the devel developed countries uh, seems like they really want to have uh, equal uh, equal collaboration or equal uh, equal work, but uh, in fact it is not at all because uh, we found out that uh, Indonesia and other developing countries and the global South countries really targeting for the market for the you know for the mining companies and also for the trade of corporate. Uh, uh, hegemony. I think uh, that is from my side because we are civil society in Indonesia really keeps pushing our government uh, to really think about uh, the people's rights, their mandate to protect our environment, our life. So this is not only about an agreement of, uh, you know, like a trading activities or selling services. It is about our life. It is about our life, people's life in the global south. So I think a lot of a lot of you coming from a global north. So I want I would like to highlight what Jean already mentioned. Please really make a big uh, pressure to your government in the global north to think about the human rights, to think about the environment and others. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ari. Really important. Um, so glad you could you could join us today. Um, uh, Rob, do you have any? I know we have a lot more questions, and I'm aware that we we're we're going until quarter past one, so we do have a bit more time. But do you have anything to say to the questions that have been posed already, or would you like yeah, to hear some yes. more? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
Look, I think the first thing I'd say is that um, we need to understand that the system itself is commanding less and less support. Uh, you know, and we need to be wary also of a debate about what replaces it. Uh, you know, I think the European Union and uh, other forces like that are also shifting away and seeing flaws uh, in the in the existing system. Now, um, that I think uh, is, is 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 something of the reality that we need to take account of. I think that the arguments that we've been having up to now have been, you know, really illustrated by the, the cases of the, um, the tobacco companies. I mean, the evident injustice of that uh, has been a, a very good illustration of the flaws in the system. But now I think that, that, that I mean, the, the fact that this is now going to be challenged in ways that are going to undermine the efforts to achieve mitigation of catastrophic climate change, this must surely create uh, uh, another nail in the coffin that I think if the campaigns are taking up the issues appropriately and actually drawing the links as I think the speakers here have done, uh, this should be an, another uh, you know, um, nail in the coffin, another, another way uh, of, of, of defeating the system. But as I said, that I think we need to be very clear about what comes in its place because there is talk about an international investment treaty through the WTO and things like that, which I think uh, would, would reproduce many of the problems uh, that we already have in the, in the existing uh, uh, ISDS system. On the question of, of, of walking away, well, I think, look, if, if my, my point would be this, if in fact signing these kind of agreements has not led to an increase in foreign direct investment, the, sa the, the same holds in reverse. Walking away from them doesn't lead to a, an, an, an outflow uh, of foreign direct investment. I think foreign investors, they look at the, the country they're going to get in, involved in. They look at what are the concrete opportunities on the ground. They look at all the, uh, the balance sheet issues and they make some kind of assessment. And I used to say when people said, well, you know, this is an additional thing beyond your constitution. I said, you know, if you imagine that there was a coup and somebody walked in, some military government walked in and tore up the constitution. You don't think they're not also going to tear up international agreements? Uh, so I said, you know, it's it, it, it's it's not an it's no more protection than you than you get from the constitution uh, of, of of our country. Uh, and uh, so uh, you know, I think that's the reality. And in fact, people make a make a, an assessment. Uh, is the government actually likely to expropriate, take over their factories without compensation? And if they don't think that's likely to happen, I think, uh, uh, you know, they, they will invest anyway. And the people that take advantage of the ISDS system, I think we need to understand they're outliers in some way. They're not mainstream investors that are coming to develop productive forces in our countries, the kind of people we want to attract and all of that. They're actually outliers of one sort or another. People in fringe uh, activities, dying industries, rent seekers, chance takers. Of, of, that's, 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 who, that's who we're dealing with, I think, uh, in the end of the day. One of the ways I think that, of course, it is the case that, um, you know, we worked a lot with UNCTAD. Uh, we, 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 we try to, 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 to work with that, you know, and strengthen our arm in this regard and, and have a kind of a, a south and a, and a general uh, development orientated approach and so on. But I, I do take the point that, I mean, I know other countries uh, who are smaller, weaker, uh, feel it, you know, they, they don't feel that they're comfortable in able to be able to do this. But one of the things we can do is, and this is what we try to do in South Africa anyway, what I think we are still trying to do it, uh, is, is, is to push in the context, for example, of the African continental free trade area for an investment arrangement that would be a, a common to the, the whole of the African continent, which would, which would be drawn on a set of principles radically and fundamentally different to those that have underlined uh, the principles in the, in the, in the, in the uh, OECD type bits. Uh, and by the way, I think that uh, I went to a meeting in, in Charmaine at some stage and I heard these arbitrators and they were trying to say to us, well, you know, you guys mustn't blame us uh, for the awards. You must blame yourselves because of the treaties that you people have been signing. Uh, and I think that there's a, there's a point there. Uh, it, is, it is when you sign an, an, an agreement with which, is, with which is as vague as all that, uh, expansive definitions, lots of ambiguity. And then you and then you expose yourself to uh, companies and arbitra uh, you know, law companies and arbitrators and things like that. What do you expect? Uh, and I think that uh, you know that, that uh, it's a, it's it's a wake up call and a warning uh, 
uh, about the debate that we need to have about what will replace us, because I think there is a recognition that the system is broken, uh, but we also need to be wary about what may uh, come in its place. Certainly, yeah. I mean, if uh, people, I'm sure people on the call are aware of the uh, supposed uh, reform efforts to ISDS that we've had, which basically um, are virtually uh, something called in investment court system that the EU attempted to introduce, which fundamentally isn't isn't any different from ISDS, um, as well as there's a reform process going on at a UN body called Un UNCITRAL, which is also um, pretty uh, fundamentally uh, failing. <laughs> um, so uh, we have, um, Kyla still to go in terms of responses. If you've seen other questions as well in the chat that you'd like to respond to, please also do chime in on those. Yeah, there's so much I'd like to say, but I'll try, try to be quick. I just want to echo a lot of what Rob said. You, not all investment is created equal, so uh, we shouldn't act like attracting everything is, is a great idea. I wouldn't let the arbitrators off so easily, though, because they do really have, um, I think a vested interest in this system and they are trying very hard to uh, keep it going. So uh, yes, states are at fault for, for writing the treaties vaguely in the first place, but I think arbitrators are doing a good job of perpetuating the system. And linking that back to the question about law firms, um, there's a great group uh, in, the, in the United States called Law Students for Climate Accountability. Uh, I've been trying to sort of do what they've done generally. They, they sort of tally up what all the law firms are making off fossil fuel cases. And um, I'm trying to do the same thing with uh, what law firms have made on arbitration because that's not included in there and, and how much they've made for fossil fuel companies. So Leah and Jane, we should talk about that sometime. I definitely think targeting law firms is a good idea. Uh, in terms of the Energy Charter Treaty, there are two sort of issues. The, the, there's one, which is that um, there's a lot of intra-EU disputes, which uh, doesn't comply with, with EU law, so the, the European Union's interested in leaving for that reason, but climate is al also a, a very big concern for a number of countries, uh, and there's this wonderful campaign that is being organized around that treaty, so that's why I have some optimism that it might at least in part be cancelled for climate reasons, but obviously uh, we're still uh, working on that. And the one thing to note, which relates to the question of, of walking away, is that there are these survival clauses in, in survival clauses in these agreements that mean that basically if you unilaterally withdraw, then they still work for another uh, 20 years, 15, 20 years. Um, so we, we need to have coordinated action. And this again, this might be possible for the EU to have a coordinated action and eliminate all uh, the intra-EU disputes, which would be a huge chunk of the ECT. But when we're talking about bilateral treaties, again, between Global North and Global South, uh, the flows of investment are very asymmetrical. So it's Canadian mining companies going uh, into Latin America and other parts of the world and bringing these cases, but those countries are not sending investors here. So the Canadian government doesn't have much of an incentive to, with to have a coordinated withdrawal. And so we really, in the Global North, uh, as Ari said, we have an obligation to really pressure our governments on this because the Global South countries face these survival clauses if they try to unilaterally withdraw and walk away. Um, saw a couple other questions in the chat that I'll just uh, note briefly. Someone said, what if a government refuses to pay? Uh, the problem with this system is that it's highly enforceable. So around the world, uh, these investors can go to the any of the courts that are party to these big treaties, UNCTRAL Treaty, the ICSID Treaty, sorry for the acronyms, and basically enforce these awards in the courts there. So um, anywhere that a government has any assets, like a, um, a consulate, they can go in and, and, or any other kind of assets that they own in other countries, they can go and enforce the award and, and take the money that way. So highly enforceable, unlike environmental law. Um, somebody else mentioned Stephen uh, Donzingers. I'm very sympathetic with his case, but I think one thing that often gets lost in the discussion about the uh, Ecuador um, pollution case is that uh, Chevron successfully took Ecuador to arbitration. Uh, it's still ongoing, but basically the results of that means that if uh, the courts try to enforce the award against Chevron for the for billions of dollars worth of, of damage to the people who have suffered from pollution in Ecuador, then basically the arbitration will turn around and take that money from the Ecuadorian government. It's a complete injustice that goes alongside the injustice that has been um, taken against Stephen Donzinger in the US courts. Uh, so I just wanted to add that and I will turn it back over to you, Leah. Thank you so much. Thank you for picking up. Um, that, that's a, a great question that I think we should probably try to address because it comes up every time. Is like, what 
what happens if a country says no i don't agree with this um but yeah the scary thing is is that it can they can have it enforced often anyway so um, we're coming to the close uh of our session um and i think uh, i found it really informative anyway we we know why we need to uh stand up against isds investor to state dispute settlement i don't know if we had it was actually said the, the full acronym but we also call it corporate courts um to shame the the law firms and arbitrators that are making a mint from the system we know why it's urgent because we know that we see we have climate cases um, already and there's more coming down the track. We've been shown how it can be done. We know that it can be done and what's missing is the political will. And I think that's where we come in. Um, I don't know if people saw, took part in, were inspired by any of the uh, climate strikes that were taking place on Friday and yesterday. They certainly filled me with a little bit of hope that um, the climate movement is genuinely sort of coming to terms with some of the challenges that our economic system uh, creates to the world we need to see, to having something like a global Green New Deal that not only abolishes ISDS, but also looks at other as aspects of our trade and investment framework um, that urgently need to change. Because it's not hyper hyperbole to say that the climate crisis is the most sort of pre pressing ethical and political issue of our lifetimes, and we need to do everything we can to both address that, but also address global injustices that countries like the UK and other countries in the global north have been at the forefront of creating. Um, so in terms of what what we as WARA want, Global Justice Now and the other campaigning organisations involved in organising this uh, want to do is to really ramp up the pressure on the UK government to leave the Energy Charter Treaty, um, to drop ISDS. So there is a, um, a petition that we have open, and I know it's been shared in the chat, and that's, go that's going to be um, handed in to the UK government in December, which is when the Energy Charter Treaty has its annual conference. And so um, anything you can do to spread the word about the Energy Charter Treaty, about ISDS and the threat to the climate from corporate courts um, would be fantastic. Um, and we'll be sharing information um, from both of our organizations about how you can be involved in that. Um, and uh, I'd like to, again, thank so much to the COP26 Coalition uh, for hosting this event and providing all of the tech support from our speakers, Kyla, Ari, Rob, and Jean, who've joined us from around the world in different time zones and with different uh, technical uh, challenges. Uh, it's been fantastic to hear your perspectives today. Um, and yeah, I will, we will, this session will be recorded so it will be possible uh, for people to sort of watch it again or share it. Um, and we, I will consent around to anyone who's registered also some of the links that have been shared in the chat so you can do some of that further reading and know about the, the next actions that are going to be happening. Um, so with that, uh, I think I will close and wish you all a fantastic rest of People Summit if there's other events you're attending uh, this week. And um, yeah, hope that people making decisions at COP are hearing this really important call on corporate courts. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.